In Goal Radio, the podcast, uh, on the air with you. Today's feature interview, New Jersey Devil goaltender Mackenzie Blackwood. This on the heels of another sensational In Goal in-person webinar with Bill Ranford, the goalie coach for the Los Angeles Kings, a Stanley Cup champion, a Conn Smythe Trophy winner, a Canada Cup winner, and a... Uh, a world champion, and uh, that was fantastic. This week, we have Brayden Holtby coming up, along with his sports psychologist, John Stevenson, and uh, that's going to be a great one as we bring in the co-founders of Ingoal Magazine, David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley. They call it the COVID pause, but you guys have been working as hard as ever cranking out the content over at Ingoal Mag. It's been, uh, it's been an opportunity. I almost feel bad to say it because... I know it's been really hard on so many people, but this opportunity for us to be in the office and cranking out content, making new things happen has been, it's been really refreshing and really exciting and, and how good to be able to get the whole goaltending community together on, on all of these in goal in person, uh, meetups on the weekend. I think it's just been fantastic and so lucky to have a guy like, uh, Bill Ranford who wants to you know, expand his craft to learn more about the game himself, to be a student of the game as a coach, uh, just jumping in with both feet and becoming a part of the community. So I just absolutely loved last weekend. I loved all of the meetups that we've done. And, uh, and I'm super excited about this weekend too, Woody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously Braden Holtby, everybody knows who he is. They know the relationship with John Stevenson, his former goalie coach in the WHL, longtime goalie coach and sports psychologist. Uh, the first guy he thanked when he won the Stanley Cup uh, and they put a microphone in front of him. You know, that was the first name that uh, that he mentioned in terms of guys he wanted to thank. So uh, I'm excited about this. We've seen John Stevenson present. We've had some of John's articles uh, and tips, uh, how to juggle in 10 minutes, uh, some of the ball drills and his four keys for ball drills up at Ingle Premium already. Uh, but to get to delve into that relationship and some of the roots of the exercises that we've kind of gotten to know Braden Holt before, whether it's the eyes darting back and forth before a game, the water bottle squirt, all the different mechanisms that he uses to stay sharp mentally and focused, um, have have roots, have origins in his work with John Stevens. And so excited about that. And you're right, Hutch, it does seem odd to say excited amid all this because a lot of people are struggling. But I think for us it isn't it's been an opportunity because we are at home to make sure we can provide content for others who are stuck at home to have something to do and not just stuff to read through the magazine and videos to watch and to try and get better when we do get back on the ice. But um, the in goal in person webinars have been great because they really do bring everyone together and develop that sense of community that has been at times hard to achieve through social distancing. I'm really looking forward this weekend to seeing how much of that John and Braden relationship that we see, because we first met John in person anyway, uh, last summer at the seminar he put on with Pete Fry in Vancouver, and he got pretty personal with some of the stories that he, to that he told. He got quite open with a lot of those stories, not the kind of thing that we would just open up and share in an article with the world, and, uh, but they were fascinating to see a, a side of the younger Braden as he was developing into the world-class goaltender that he is. Um, I'm hoping we get to pull the curtain back there a little bit this weekend and, and learn a bit about that development. I think we will, because I know we have the right man, the right host for the job to pull those little things out of both of them. And Darren Millard, who's been just killing it as our host on these webinars at Ingle in person every weekend. Thank you, Darren. Well, let me burst your bubble because I'm most excited about seeing what the flow is like on Holpe uh, through this whole thing <laughs> and what that beard is doing. Uh, he's, he's one of the, those guys that play, I don't, I don't know how he plays with a beard oh. quite, quite honestly, but, uh, so yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great. And I like John, uh, as a sports psychologist, but also as a goaltender and that background uh, on the position. So it's going to be a really unique, uh, uh, conversation that we have, uh, that's going to occur this weekend on the heels of Bill Ranford. And again, talk about the, uh, the, uh, visual, uh, Bill Ranford's man cave. It's one of the coolest things. That, so cool. uh, that that's that's been up there in these uh there's information is amazing but just we can all relate to the uh to the man caves and it was it was spectacular and after he showed it to us at at the end and showed it to our audience like i almost kind of wished the whole session was set up with 
you know, maybe the computer turned so that the four Stanley Cup four replica cups, trophies yeah. were over his shoulder instead of the masks in the background. Um, Bill's been, you know, Hutch said it so well. He's just so gracious with his time with us and so involved. And it's organic, not just that he's he's so gracious with our audience in terms of sharing his stories and his insight and his advice with them. But he really did, you know, sort of hop into our first webinar to try and learn more about uh, about equipment right. that some of his prospects were going to wear. So, again, um, this I don't mean for this to sound like a back padding session, but it's more us just being excited about watching this community grow uh, at Ingoal and through Ingoal Premium and the Ingoal webinars. We we can't help it. It's it's pretty cool to see this happening around us and pretty neat to be a part of it. Hotch, I know you want to jump in here, but you mentioned community, Woody. And Wayne Labrie sent me a note after because he was uh, mentioned as uh, one of the partners from uh, Billy's days with the new Westminster Bruins. So uh, Wayne, uh, shout out to you. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, that was cool to uh, to get a, a comment back from you as well. Yeah, I just love getting all the notes. I mean, they're they're growing more and more every week where listeners just fire a note. Thanks so much. Tell us that they were sitting down with their son or their daughter or where they were as they were listening to the webinar. Or, which article they were reading and how it's influencing what they're they're doing with their time off. Uh, honestly, we just love getting those when you're you're coming off a, a late night or an early morning putting something together. Just to get that couple of lines from somebody is a real pick me up, and and it means the world, eh, Woody? Well, especially a minor now addressed Woody, right? Like like <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like yeah. that's how I know you get you've gotten a few that say Dad Hutch, but I minor yeah. minor Woody. I just like it's like hey Woody, um, thanks for this. Can you ask this question? Uh, you know, like when they're submitting questions and stuff. So I know that you know the people listening to the podcast or the people that are getting involved in the webinars and involved. In, there's a real crossover there. And like I said, it all just continues to grow. One quick note about the whole B webinar. We have been somewhat consistently 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time on these Saturdays. I think three of the three of the four so far. This one, take note, will be noon Pacific, three o'clock Eastern time with Braden Holtby and John Stevenson. So when you add it into the calendar, make sure you shave off that hour and you don't miss it. And it's part of the uh, great benefits of uh, being an Ingle Premium subscriber. How do people get involved if they're not a subscriber yet and they're hearing about all this great content, Hutch? Do they participate in the webinar with Braden Holtby and John Stevenson? Super easy. Go to ingolmag.com and you will find a link up there to subscribe. The, the home page for Ingol is open so that everybody can see all the different articles that are available. I think we're north of. 130 or something like that now. Uh, you can see every one of the pro reads that we've had, every one of the drills, every one of the mental articles. I mean, there's all kinds of content up there. And you can click through to almost all the articles as well. But then, you know, as with many subscription sites, you don't get to see the entire article. But right up at the top of ingoalmag.com, if, if you think you want to become a member, uh, you can can register right there and then you'll be given access to the uh, the page where you register for the webinar and it is a registration one because we know uh, Braden's a big name and we're sure to get uh, a full house for the weekend so do encourage you to uh, get your registration in early so that you have your spot reserved 500 spots total and they're going fast it's Wednesday right now and uh, they are like I literally every time I check my email there's another 510 people that have registered so if you're listening now, don't waste any time. Go check it out and grab your spot. Can't promise that we'll get to your question, but there is a Q&A part of the uh, Ingle in-person webinars that we've been doing. Uh, send in your questions. Uh, we'll make a list, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll ask your question. So that's also a really intriguing part of it, uh, having to be able to fire a question off to Carrie Price or Bill Ranford or Braden Holtby. Uh, world-class goaltenders, world-class goalie coaches, uh, and uh, winners all the way around. So uh, that's going to be uh, very cool. Braden Holpe, John Stevenson, coming up on this week's webinar, In Goal, In Person, Saturday at noon Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern time. We teased it last week, the uh, contest uh, that we have uh, running with In Conjunction, In Goal Mag, with uh, CCM and the uh, access line, and Hutch, can you walk us through with a little more detail this time around? <laughs> a little more detail than go to ingoalmag.com yes. and sign up? <laughs> we try and keep it simple. We're trying to 
take away all those barriers to people joining us, barriers to people entering. Um, but it's it it again is quite simple. Um, head over to ingoldmag.com and you will find an article uh, talking all about the contest. It is wide open. You do not need to be a member to see the the article. You don't need to be a member to enter the contest. If you don't want to go to Ingold to see it, you can find it also on our Instagram page. And uh, and how to do it is fairly easy. You head over to CCM and book some time in your schedule with the CCM Access Customizer. And you can head down a very large rabbit hole there because there are basically unlimited combinations that you can design. Design a set of pads that you love and uh, take a screenshot. I know it's a little challenging sometimes to screenshot the pads and the gloves and so on, but screenshot the pads at least. Put them up on Instagram, on your feed, please. And uh, make sure you followed and tagged both InGoal Mag and CCM Goalie and use the hashtag Woody. CCM Axis All Out. Nice. You almost did that like my old podcast app reads. You just need to chew on the microphone a little Can bit I ask more. You a question? Should do that. Hutch, yeah. Did you forget or did you just uh, want Woody to say, say wanted, the line? I wanted Woody to see it because I've actually got the little ad for it right okay. up on my screen. Here, Sometimes so I, I forget and I, I, get, I make it sound like like you're really teeing it up because you've got all the information. Yeah. I, but but really, I just, I've just forgotten. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's an old teacher's trick. I've, I've pulled that one a million times before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Believe me. Um, uh, so, so really exciting contest. And that's all you have to do is enter, is to post it on your Instagram feed or your Twitter feed and, and, and use the hashtag. However, it has been fun to see that a few people have gone above and beyond, and it's not really going to get you uh, a better chance of winning, but I did see one last night where somebody had cut a music video um, as they went through the Axis customizer to the beat of the music as they were selecting each and every what? little color really? zone. Oh yeah, it was epic. Um, great effort. There have been, been other great efforts. We're putting some of them up on our feed uh, um, for people to see, on our story, excuse me. Uh, but there's just so many coming in. It's, it's a real challenge to get them all up there. But we do appreciate each and every one that goes in. Choose your colors wisely. Choose your colors wisely because if you are the lucky winner, and uh, we do have a panel of celebrity judges who will be helping making that choice, and uh, and if you are the lucky winner, um, that's the set that you're ordering because you've put it into the customizer, and of course, we're really excited to see your set come to life. Um, We've so, had, I've so had Woody, a lot Woody, of those questions where people are like, uh, "Can I enter more than once?" And I'm like, "Yes, you can." But, fair, yeah, good one. But remember, remember, the set that wins is the set that CCM is going to make for you. So don't go crazy with the colors. If it's not what matches something you're going to play in, because you don't get to win with that wild purple, yellow, green madness you design, like some type <laughs> of mad scientist, and then claim the all white set with a little bit of red trim that you entered, you know, five times earlier. So make sure you love it before you enter it. But uh, really, the only limit is your imagination. I still think it's a win, even if even if you design something like spectacularly out there. I'd still make it work. It's a I free think, set think, of gear. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> and uh, like this, we're talking pads and gloves, right? Oh yeah, pads and gloves. And you can also uh, find on in goal. And if it's not on the uh, contest page, I'll make sure it's linked there. You can get uh, a little overview of our first impressions of Axis. We've had it on the ice. We had a demo set for a while before we got the in goal set, and uh, and feedback was fantastic. So I I, I know it's um. You know, every time it's a brand new set, a brand new line, people are not quite sure what they're getting. We're not able to do the full review quite yet because we we can't get on the ice anymore. Um, but but the first impressions were were really positive in terms of having a a stiff pad with huge rebounds. But the the boot changed a little bit. We know that this is sort of the evolution of the Premier line, but the boot did change, and we've got a much more eflex like boot. And uh, and the testers. What does really that mean for that. people who aren't familiar with the line? Yeah, so the boot is a little softer, and uh, and the boot isn't quite as steep uh, of an angle. You've got a a more not really a ninety degree boot angle. Woody, you're way better at the technical side of this. That's but, flat. Uh, it's just a, it's a flatter boot. Yeah. It sits more on top of your skate. It's not like where the premier used to be a very steep 
sort yeah. of, you know, boot up from the skate up to the, that sort of break was a very steep angle. This is just a little, little flatter, a little more flush with the skate and just you know, a, a departure for them. Yeah. And we had a, we had one tester who wasn't as excited about premier and was, was more of a, an access goalie, excuse me, an eflex goalie. Um, but really loved the access to the point of ordering a set because just found the integration into the post a little bit better with with the uh, with the boot. What about the celebrity judges? Woody, it's not me, Hutch, and Darren. That's, even but bigger. we could be like if we if, even if, bigger if we had to, we could. If we Darren, named, Darren's probably a big enough name. We'd have to add Cam, but between me and Cam, we wouldn't be able to get our heads through the door if we called ourselves <laughs> celebrity judges. Um, no, we, uh, we, we, we took it up, up a little bit of a notch. Uh, the people judging this contest with us will be none other than Jean-Sebastien Jaguer, Charlene Labonte, and Roberto Luongo. So three goaltenders who have had success in the National Hockey League, on the international stage. Charlene's a four-time uh, Olympic gold medalist. Roberto's got two Olympic gold medals. Uh, Jiggy's got the cup, a Conn Smythe trophy. I mean, some very accomplished goaltenders who all also happen to wear the CCM Premier line that is being replaced by Axis. So we thought it was fitting that those were the goalies that helped decide the winner. Um, you've got until the end of May, final day of May. So I'm looking at May 31st is the Sunday to enter we'll have the winners by june 5th we'll announce our winner and ccm will get to building that set of uh, dream pads and hutch contest prohibited where not allowed yeah that's right <laughs> if we're not allowed to do this we're not doing it <laughs> <laughs> that's my disclaimer hey let's yeah. get into the feature interview this week uh, mackenzie blackwood he's 23 years old and he started this season as a full-time National Hockey League goaltender at 23 years old, played in the NHL part of the year at 22. That's incredible uh, when you consider some of the guys that we've talked to have, uh, have for, for good reason, have just had to buy their time and, and, uh, and have made really big strides uh, through the course of being patient. But we're seeing uh, Blackwood sort of be part of this group that's uh, that's bursting out of the scene. Uh, we are, as as we were all talking about before, we're starting to see some younger guys getting earlier opportunities and and maybe having a little bit more success. And uh, as opposed to a guy like Chris Dreger, who got his first shot at twenty six, who was on the podcast with us last week, uh, and 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 as you said, um, twenty two. For Blackwood, but he's actually a December baby, so in many ways, um, he's he's almost a year younger than that in terms of his minor hockey upbringing. Well, yeah, and he actually played. He was in the NHL like his first shot last year, which is kind of he's stuck since was at the age of twenty one. Yeah, so not not unprecedented. Certainly, there have been other young goalies, but but a lot of the the talk in recent years has been that if any position needs time to sort of slow cook in the in the American League, it's it's the goaltender. But what do you think? There's some Something to that now. Well, especially these guys from Thunder Bay. I mean, my God. Yeah. Um, what a, it's an absolute mafia of goaltenders from T Bay now. Um, no, I do think, and, and Mackenzie talked about this. He talked about all these things in the interview, but this one in particular struck home a little for me because it's a part of a conversation I've had with other guys that, you know, the game has changed. No question. Uh, a lot more lateral plays, offense, the way teams have gone about generating offense, the focus on east west plays. And then back east again, um, the deceptive releases, the way that shooters are going to school on goaltenders and learning how to show one thing and deliver another with their shots, the way they're learning to create offense to specifically exploit the butterfly or the old style of goaltending, the, the style that's been played in the NHL for the last 10 years. Well, guess what? That may be, dealing with that offense may be a massive adjustment for some of the guys who have spent the last six, seven years in the National Hockey League. But for a lot of these guys I talked to, including Blackwood in this interview here, uh, Thatcher Demko, uh, Carter Hart, some of these other young guys, this is what they grew up with. This That type of dynamic offensive player and those type of dynamic offensive styles and run and gun type mentality, this is, this is not an adjustment for them. And so, yeah, there still is a learning curve and there still are evolutions and the path may not be the same for everyone. But in terms of adjusting to the game right now, a lot of these young guys are 
it's less of an adjustment than it is for some of the older guys. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, the Russian goalies that we're seeing have success as soon as they come over. Uh, Vasilevsky, Shishterkin. Um, again, are, are we going to see more teams at least be willing to give some of the, the big sort of prize prospect up and comers a shot early on rather than always sticking with that? No, more time, more time is better. Um, cause some of these guys certainly look ready at a younger age than they have in recent years. And we discussed, uh, Jonathan Bernier's season when he was on in goal radio, the podcast and how incredible. Uh, his performance was uh, head to head to the partner, and and just the relative success uh, with the Detroit Red Wings. Mackenzie Blackwood is along the same lines. Twenty two wins this year. The team had won twenty eight overall uh, at the pause. That's an incredible number uh, when you look at the the discrepancy. So, uh, real real solid season in his first as a full-time National Hockey Leaguer and taking over the number one job with the New Jersey Devils. Uh, A lot to get to with Mackenzie Blackwood, drafted 42nd overall, a journey that went from Thunder Bay to Barrie, uh, Adirondack, Binghamton, Albany, and now the New Jersey Devils and the National Hockey League. Here's Mackenzie with Kevin. Wood meets Wood. (laughs) Uh, I don't even know what else to to talk about when we go with that. A- any oak, oak, and uh, any any other suggestions I, there? I feel like this is not the place to work in the fact that my local radio segment is called the Morning Wood. <laughs> Plywood, uh, six by four. It's a wall uh, with uh, with Woody and uh, Mackenzie on In Goal Radio, the podcast. And I think the first question that everyone wants to know from all the goaltenders we've talked to, McKenzie, is just how you holding up amid all this and what have you been up to? I've just been, uh, you know, staying at home, uh, trying to do as as much as I can to, you know, stay engaged uh, physically, mentally. But uh, at the same time, like you were just talking to me there, um, you know, it's been a while now. So we're starting to, you know, be kind of in that limbo stage where you don't know if it's going back, if you're staying uh, here for a little bit while longer. So, you know, I'm doing a little bit of, uh, you know, workouts at home and stuff like that. Nothing too crazy, but just something to keep me, you know, at that uh, middle ground. So if we do go back, I'm not too far off. And if it does shut down, I can just kind of keep where I'm at and maintain my low uh, impact kind of off season training right now. So I'm kind of in that middle ground. Uh, somewhere around there just trying to stay in the middle so that if it does pick up I'm close enough that it's not too hard to get back and where I'm also not uh, beating my body up too much so I'm kind of staying in the middle and uh, at the same time you know trying to stay safe amongst all this Um, you know spending a little bit of time with you know family members at a distance and uh, you know just trying to trying to do what I can you back in Thunder Bay yeah, back home now. Okay, so when you talk about the off-ice stuff, um, can you give, I mean, especially for goalies, we're hearing this from a lot of young goalies as well. We've run a couple of webinars, and that's one of the one of the questions they had big time, whether it was for Kerry or for Braden this weekend. That's what we get from all the young goalies is, what can I do physically? What are some of the things you've been doing? I know we had Devin McConnell on as a guest on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he blew us away with with his knowledge base. What's your focus yeah. as a goalie right now? Is it like, is it, is it mobility work? Is there a cardio component? And I know equipment can be a limitation. How have you managed to find that? For balance? sure. For sure. So um, I'm doing a little bit of everything. I'm mostly what I'm doing right now is like uh, strengthening with light, light weights and nothing too crazy at all, low impact. And I'm doing a lot of stretching and yoga kind of, I like that kind of stuff for this time of year, especially. Um, I'm just trying to uh, keep my body, you know, from getting out of shape whilst kind of maintaining that, uh, you know, flexibility. Because, you know, as a goaltender, that's so important. So um, I'm just kind of in that, uh, that stage where I'm doing a lot, of, a lot of yoga, some light strengthening and a little bit of core. I haven't done a whole ton of cardio conditioning because um, obviously I, I, I'm not a big advocate for running. 
that's not really something I do a lot. I mean, some guys might, but I'm just not a big runner. I, I like to prefer my conditioning. I do, uh, you know, outside these, uh, these like shuttle runs and, and just sort of tight court courts, sorry, close quarter stuff and uh, on the wind bike and, and any kind of bike. So I'm more of a, um, you know, short burst kind of person when I train. I do a little bit of the long stuff when uh, Devin or the other trainer, Joe in Jersey make us, but uh, I like to do more short burst conditioning with the odd long conditioning. So um, just, just a little bit of, uh, of both there for me. Okay. Now, how has that uh, changed over the years for you? How's it evolved? Because uh, not to give away too many secrets on who told me what, but talking to some of the, some of the guys you've played with and, and some of the, at the NHL level, but also some of the, some of the goalie coaches you work with, like if, if you work out a certain way, like you can, you can have football player size and build pretty quickly <laughs> if you go, if you go at it heavy. Yeah. So that's definitely changed over the years when I was younger around 17, 18, I was doing a lot more strengthening and uh, a lot more power and, 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 uh, you know, without kind of having a, a direction as much. So I was just kind of doing the, the cookie cutter workouts, like where, yeah, put on a bunch of weight, you get stronger and sort of, uh, as a, a product of that, you get a little bit bigger. So for me, I found out that when I do that, I get really big, really quickly. So I had to kind of cut that down a lot and uh, limit my weights to a, a certain amount. But that was a, a product of trial and error. You know, when I was about 19 years old, I was much too big to be a goalie. I think I was pushing 240 there. So and I wasn't too fat either. So it was, I was too bulky and I recognized that. And, and we talked about that with, you know, strength coaches and stuff like that. So I did kind of cut my weights down a little bit and the reps, and, uh, you know, figure out more of a sustainable approach for myself. So now I hover around 225 and that's kind of where I like to play at because I feel much more mobile and I'm still strong, but it's not too much impact on me there. Yeah. I was going to say at 245, like that's just, I can imagine, you know, we've seen the studies where dropping into a butterfly is three times your natural body weight, that how much force is generated. That's, that's a lot of pressure on the lower body, no matter how strong it is. For sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with the help of, uh, you know, good trainers along the way and, you know, also trial and error and how I feel. So uh, I've started to find that range to where I feel the most comfortable and, uh, and where I feel like I can play my best at. You uh, talked about at uh, the beginning there earlier about, I mean, obviously physically um, staying in shape and ready to return on, you know, a few weeks notice if that's the case. You mentioned engaged. Um, We've seen guys that are looking at video clips of themselves. Uh, we've seen some guys go take it to, you know, next level. I know you have a relationship with Carter and he's a guy that likes his tools, his visual edge trainers and guys are, we've seen virtual reality, anything that you've tinkered with or tried on that end to sort of keep the brain and on, on mind of the game. Uh, you know, it, for me every year, it's, it's, this is kind of a weird time right now. So for me every year, once the season's over and the season has come to an end, I kind of take, about a month, month and a half off mentally. I just don't think about hockey at all. Get away from it for that short period of time. And I feel like that refreshes me. Whereas this is kind of a, a weird time where, you know, I still kind of have it in the back of my mind where we could go back, we could not. It's it's kind of weird. So, you know, um, I've still been like watching some clips here and there. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, just kind of keeping my brain like, uh, aware of like hockey and, and reads and, and, you know, situations, but not to, t not to the nth extreme, just here and there, um, maybe on the couch when I'm bored, I'll pull up a clip or whatever and, and just watch some stuff. And you'd be surprised that like when you watch hockey and you watch yourself, how it kind of puts your, your body and your mind back into that, like, uh, performance stage, it's kind of like whatever you're watching, you feel it kind of. So, um, I personally right now, had this been the end of the year, I would be totally off. I wouldn't be doing much right now since the season would have ended for us in New Jersey around the middle of April. So I probably would be just starting to ramp back up in June, June 1st. But uh, yeah, this is a strange time. So I haven't been doing anything too crazy right now. I haven't been doing too, too much with that. But just the odd time, I will be watching some clips and stuff like that to kind of keep myself uh, from completely shutting it off. So when you watch a clip, when you watch yourself play, whether it's a clip or, a, you know, a, a, 
somebody sends you five minutes of tape or whatever, do you, when you talk about really engaging with that, like, are you watching yourself from the mind's eye? Are you seeing yourself like how you would see the puck or are you like sort of like bird's eye view of yourself? How do you, there's a visualization component there. It feels like, and, and I'm just, yeah. you know, curious because we get that question too, from a lot of kids, like, you know, how do you go about your visualization? It sounds like there's an element of it there. Yeah, for sure. So when I watch myself, um, I, I'd like to watch from both. So bird's eye view is good because you get the big picture. And then I like to think about what I'm seeing at, at each moment of it too. So like, I like to see what I look like because you never really get to see yourself play unless you watch a clip, which is kind of strange because, you know, you don't know how you look while you're moving. So when you watch it from the bird's eye view, you kind of see the big picture. And then I look at what am I seeing there? So what am I thinking? What am I seeing? So I kind of get the, the dual aspect of it there, kind of seeing what's going on. And I can kind of remember back to what I was thinking there or what I was seeing and, and kind of, you know, correlate the two and see, oh, this is what I did good. And this is what I could have done better here. So it's a little bit of both. And I think that helps me a lot to come when I'm in the next situation. How does, how does that compare like watching it at home in the summer? Or, I mean, I don't even hesitate to call it the summer. It's almost June and I don't even know what we call it right now, but in a normal situation where it's, where you're, where you're away from the team watching a clip, how would that compare to say a video session with Roley? Obviously we're massive fans of Roley Melanson, got to know him here in Vancouver and watch him work. And you know, one of the, one of the great coaches in the league. Um, what, what's it like when you're watching video with him compared to sort of maybe say watching yourself, how much, how much does that change? Or do you learn to sort of watch a clip in some ways the way he would with you? I was just about to say that I, I think since I've spent enough time with Roly now and gotten to know, you know, him and what he expects and, and the way he thinks that I look at things, you know, from my perspective, but in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about you know, what would Roly see here? Or what would he think here too? So um, it's a little bit of both. Um, I like to still continue to look at things the way that I would too, because then it kind of keeps the you aspect of, you know, your own position. But at the same time, you know, roley has been a great goalie coach to a lot of great goalies and he definitely knows what he's talking about and he's helped me a lot. So, you know, I like to, I like to take in a lot of things that, uh, I've learned from him and those are things that are drilled into my mind now that I'll never forget. And, uh, you know, it's still, there's always the you aspect as well. So some things that I would do or what I would think in my head versus what someone else would. So I like to kind of blend the two. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer with goaltending in general. I think it's always a little bit about, you know, you're a goalie and you're your own, you're your own entity kind of thing. And then everyone else you can take, pieces from what they tell you and find what works for you and kind of blend it all together. And then that's kind of what you are. No absolutes, right? That's what we love about the position too. There is no, there's no one way to do this, is there? Absolutely not. (laughs) Now, um, you know, speaking of role, can you give us a couple of examples of those things and like some that you might be comfortable sharing? I know you may not be comfortable with all, but when you talk about, you know, some, the voices that you hear where you hear him, um, versus something you like to maybe do differently whether it's maybe different than Corey or you know different than one of your goalie partners because these are all goalies are there any little examples you can give us I'm guessing with rolling you know blue ice in front of the toes is probably one of them or has that evolved too yeah yeah so when I first came up uh to New Jersey um I had a tendency I would over challenge in certain situations I was a little more aggressive than really liked and then you know he explained to me you know the blue ice game, he calls it. So keeping yourself compact in the net. I mean, there's times and places where you need to get out and get a little bit more white ice, just a little bit, not too much, but uh, you know, when guys are coming down right in the house, right down the slot, I mean, it's the time and a place where you can take a little bit more, but when everything's on the perimeter, you, you want to stay back. And, and that's something that he's really, you know, helped me um, incorporate into my game. So, you know, I think when I watch clips, I look at my positioning, and uh, I kind of contrast what I was thinking or seeing and, and what he would be thinking and, and seeing. So um, there's a couple things that really has really, really helped me with. So I would say definitely compacting my game a lot. That's helped me like crazy. And the other thing that was huge for me is he's a big advocate on never letting anything through you. If you let something through you, regardless of how it went in, it's a bad goal. Even if it's a one-timer and it finds a way through your arm, if you if you let it through you, he doesn't like that. So that was the one big thing about uh, 
you know, in the first two years with him is staying tight but loose at the same time so he can move and react, but always sealing up the hole so nothing's through you. So they have to beat you with a good shot. Now, in Thunder Bay, um, I'm not sure what the weather's like there these days, but uh, <laughs> what, like, do you get out? You said you got outside train stuff. Have you had an opportunity at all to skate or? be on the ice or take any shots or like, again, you're kind of stuck in between both those worlds. Is that something you wouldn't even be looking to do at this point anyways? I would be starting to think about skating in the next week or two, very lightly though, not nothing too crazy, maybe once, once a week now. Um, but no, our, all our rinks are closed right now. You can't get ice time. Okay. So um, yeah, I haven't skated yet. Um, it's been quite a while actually now that I think about it, but um yeah, I would definitely start to think about skating now. I was actually going to text Zuli and see when he's available and when we can start to get things going again. But uh, you know, we're on a we're not on our timeline. We're on you know our city and in the world's timeline. So I know in Sweden they've got a got a couple skates in now, but no, here we're not uh, we're not quite there yet. So for now, I haven't skated, but uh, definitely starting to think about it. And uh, you know it gets to be that time where you take that time off and then you start to want to get back to it because, you know, you feel like you're, you've been away for it for a while and you kind of get hungry to get back and uh, get back and kind of on the horse. I was going to say, there's a couple of ways I could go there. But I, I, the end point there, is that why it's important for you to take that month off? Like to, to, to get back to wanting to be out there. And a lot of guys like we, Gary price, same thing, right? Like he does not touch the ice until August. Is that a, is that, is that big for you? Like, do you feel you'd lose something Huge. if you didn't have it? Huge. If I, if I started skating right away after the season was over, I'm a huge advocate of getting away from it for a while and taking your time off. Um, that's, that's been a big thing that uh, I've been told by a lot of veteran goalies and a lot of veteran coaches and stuff like that. So um, when you're younger, it's hard to do because you feel like you're falling behind. But I feel like what you gain from taking that time off is more valuable than the once a week, once a week or twice a week skates that you would get in the summer, because it's hard to develop when you're only going once a week or twice a week or whatever it is, you know? Um, I feel like once you start ramping it up and you're going every second day or whatever it is towards the end of the summer, every day, um, that's when you start to get back to uh, your form. But I think mentally the biggest thing for me is, you know, getting away from it for a while creates that hunger and that drive to want to get back and want to improve and want to get better. If you do something all year round, you kind of get stagnant a little bit. You feel like you're just going through the motions, or at least I do anyway. So I think that time off is huge uh, for me physically and most importantly mentally. I mean, let the body heal up a little bit because, you know, it's a high-impact sport on your hips and your knees. But uh, I think mentally that's the biggest thing for me is, you know, being able to get away from it for a little while. And then when you are away from it, you get that hunger to come back and, and want to get back after it. And then that's kind of what fuels you right into the season. Now, did you play other sports? Like, or were you a, like, what's your background in terms of, we always ask, when did you first become a goalie? Did you play other sports to a certain age or do you get locked into hockey and goaltending pretty early on? Uh, I like to do a lot of different things when I was a kid. Like I played lacrosse a lot in the summertime. That was my summer sport. I played lacrosse. Um, I liked to golf a lot when I was a kid. I mean, that doesn't really, I feel like that just doesn't help you with, you know, your overall athleticism, but it's a fun thing to do to get your mind off of it. Hey, what, um, hey actually, one, one shot at a time mentally, right? Like yeah, whether yeah, it's I, I pro guess, goalies or pro golfers, we all want to take it one shot at a time. For sure. For sure. Actually, that's true. Um, and up until I was about 13, 14 years old, I was a huge, huge into snowboarding even while I was playing. So that was kind of funny. I actually took a year off of hockey when I was 10 to, to take a year off and snowboard. So, um, I didn't start playing goalie till I was 12. Um, I started as a, a forward and a defenseman just playing for fun. And then when I was 12, our, our goalie at the time got sick for the last game of the year, second two games of the year. And I was like, yeah, I'll go in that. Sure. And, uh, I loved it. And then the next year I was enrolled full time in it. And then just kind of, I ever looked back from there, just kind of, started to click for me. Okay. So there's a good lesson there because in the NHL at, at the age of 22, um, pretty much full time last year. And you didn't start till you were 12 years old. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that feel like they're behind if their kid isn't a full-time goalie by eight, nine, we like to stress, you know, whether it's, whether it's Braden Holpe used to tell us, you know, playing out 
for a longer period of time benefited him hugely as a goaltender playing other sports, doing other things. It sounds like there's a really good lesson there from Mackenzie Blackwood in terms of you don't need to be a full-time goalie at eight years old to make it. Absolutely not. I, I, I'm a full uh, advocate of, you know, at that young of an age, you're still developing so much that it's hard to specialize just in being a goaltender. I mean, um, being able to skate and learn how to skate and, and move your body in different ways while you're that young and developing is very important, I think. I, I think – a lot of people get locked into the idea that if I'm not doing this from day one, it's not going to happen. And I, I think, you know, being a player is different. Like you need to learn how to skate and, and be a forward at, uh, you know, probably a little bit younger of an age because, you know, it's so competitive and, and uh, you know, specialized. But I think as a goalie, you know, it's a branch of being a player. So you need to learn how to have good edges, skate. You know, I think when you, when you play forward, you, you, you know, you train your body to move in different ways. And then when you go in the net, you already know how to skate and you just teach yourself how to move in the, uh, in the goaltending way. So I think uh, the two things for me that, that uh, starting late did was one, I was already, I knew how to skate. I could skate well. Um, I had played forward in defense. Like I, I knew a little bit about those positions. And then also too, like when you start late, you feel like you, are behind so maybe you work a little harder you're a little more hungry you you feel like I don't know I feel like when I switched to goaltending it was like I was entering this whole new world so I was taking it all in I was a little bit obsessive compulsive probably with it I would go home and watch clips and videos and highlights I was in love with it so I don't know I feel like when I got that like obsession with it at that age it was go 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 and it kind of boosted me ahead of of people I think so uh, for whatever reason it was, I think that that definitely helped me. I was going to say that it just like, there's no one way to play it. There is no one path. So not right. to, not to crap on anyone who is starting at the age of eight or nine. That's not my intent, but, um, th- that is interesting that you, you know, that, that hunger came from that. Where, where did the passion come from? Just, you tried it, you loved it. Or wh- what element did you love the most, especially at that age? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, I can't necessarily remember exactly what I loved about it the most, but I, played forward and I liked it it was fun I played defense it was fun but I didn't love it I just liked it but I don't know what it was when I switched to goaltending at that age it was just an automatic click it just clicked with me that you know I love this it was I couldn't get enough of it you know it was it was uh what I wanted to do and uh I wanted to play it every day so um I don't know I just fell in love with the sport when or the the position of goaltending when I switched and uh I can't pinpoint really exactly one thing it was about it at that age, but uh, I think the whole, you know, the goalie world, the, the stopping the, the, the good shots, you know, like being the hero for your team. I think that's kind of what I fell in love with. And then uh, it all evolves and adapts and grows from there. So. Okay. So some of the influences when you were younger, I mean, you switch to goalie at the age of 12. Thunder Bay is a hotbed of goaltenders now, or at least we think of it that way. But at the age of 12, who was your guy? Who were you looking up to, whether it was locally or in the National Hockey League? When you made that game seven overtime save in the driveway <laughs> or in practice, who were you? Uh, I was a couple of guys. My, my couple of favorite players or goaltenders at the time were I, I loved uh, Henrik Lundqvist and I loved Carey Price. Those were my two guys. But I would say above and beyond of all, it was Carey Price that I kind of fell in love with watching, you know, just the way he was. So um, I can't remember exactly what age I was when he started, you know, playing. But uh, it was right around that time, I think, where I started watching him. And I, I just loved the way he played and, and the way he moved around in the net. And um, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I remember, I don't remember exactly what age I was, but when Corey Schneider was playing in uh, Vancouver, I really, really liked him as well. So uh, it's kind of ironic that I got to be his teammate. <laughs> Not a bad guy to have as a teammate. What, what are some of the lessons you've taken from Corey over the past couple of years? Because again, when we talk about favorites and guys we've gotten to know here in Vancouver, Corey is really high on that list. Yeah, no, Corey's, Corey's an awesome guy. I mean, from watching him to like learning about who he is as a person and becoming friends with him, you know, that's just, it was incredible. I mean, you don't really know how good of a person he is until you get to meet him and have a relationship with him. Uh, so I would feel like I was really, really fortunate to be in the spot that I was. So, um, you know, Corey's been huge for me coming in and I would say the most 
that I've taken from him is just the mental side of the game. You know, he's got a really good approach and uh, he doesn't let things bother him too, too much. And, you know, like it Joe's like he's struggled a little bit over the last two years, you know, he'd be the first to tell you, but I mean, if you look at his attitude, he comes to the rink every day. He uh, doesn't let the pass bother him and he comes in hungry to keep improving and find a way to, you know, get to that next step, get to the next step. And, and I just like, I'm very, uh, in awe of his passion and the way he comes and approaches the game. He's, uh, he's been a good mentor for me. And I honestly, I think that, you know, if anyone could have been my goalie partner, I'm very, very lucky that it, that it was him. You have to be mentally strong to survive what he went through here in Vancouver, just in terms of the, the media gong show that we surrounded him with, especially back in the Luongo Schneider days. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, development at a young age in Thunder Bay, like, like you mentioned Zuli. And for those that don't know, that's Colin Zuli and Ello, who is, uh, when we talk about goalies like Matt Murray and Mackenzie Blackwood and Carter Hutton, uh, one of the ties that binds is working with Zuli in the summers. There is my understanding. When did you start with him? He's uh, for those again, that don't know uh, Calgary flames. He was their American hockey league goalie coach left them this season for family reasons and is working there in the area. Now what's, what's, what's your history with Zuli? When did you start with him? And, and walk me through some of the development keys uh, working with him in the offseason. Because he's one of our, and again, we keep common threads. Another guy that we've gotten to know a little bit over the years. And every conversation we come away from having learned something and enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I've had uh, two goalie coaches over the last six, seven years that have really helped me the most. I mean, other than number one, obviously, Roly Melanson. That guy has been huge for me uh, since I started playing in the NHL. But it was uh, Zuli and John Elkin, the two guys that really helped me kind of uh, get my game to the next level to get uh, a chance to be uh, where I was. So I, I can't remember the exact age I started working with Zuli. I was probably uh, around 15, 14, somewhere around there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I started working with him in the summer times here. So I would spend two months with him working. And then I would go down to Toronto and spend the last two weeks with John and then go right to, uh, right to wherever I was playing after that. So um, when I spent time with Julie here, he's got a really unique approach. You know, he's, uh, he's a really, really good teacher and he has a, a great approach with goaltending. I think he's one of the best at, um, you know, not changing who you are, but helping you develop what you are into something better. So, He's, he doesn't change people. He makes suggestions and tweaks and really just helps you um, with what you are. So I think that that was really big for me as well. So he didn't try to change me and, and take things out of my game and turn me into a cookie cutter. He just kind of helped me, you know, develop what I had as a skill and, and bring up areas of my game that were weaker. And he has a lot of, he has a lot of patience for things you do wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, I uh, forgot about John Elkin, and, and I actually, that's my bad. I knew that you spent some time there in the summers too, so that wasn't uh, exclusion on purpose on our fault, just um, on my end, just total total brain cramp. Um, but I knew you went there in the summers as well. With with working, one of the things that you talked about with Roly was sort of, you know, the blue ice and playing within the blue ice. How have you, how has your game evolved in terms of understanding sort of how much of the net, filling space, and the work with Zuli in terms of how much you do fill autom- automatically and, and how little you need to reach to access pucks and things like that. What, can you walk me through some of those evolutions? It sounds like maybe there may have been some ropes. Were there, was there, were there, were there different things evol- involved at different points there as you kind of learn to understand? I guess the Swedes call it box control. I've seen it presented yeah. in so many different ways over the years. But has that been a big part of your development, sort of knowing how much of that net you take up? Especially in the last two, two and a half years, that's really when I started, um, you know, understanding box control better and how little you actually have to move. I feel like when I was younger, I felt like I had to move like crazy to get here and then move like crazy to get over here and make it seem all acrobatic and athletic, (laughs) you know? Um, So I feel like as I've started to get older and, you know, I've started working with with Roly and uh, John and Zuli actually in the last two years have really helped me with that too. So I feel like it's been a good kind of uh, trifecta of three guys putting in a lot of impact or a lot of input. And uh, you know, they're all sort of telling you the same thing, but in their own way. 
Um, but yeah, no box controls or whatever you want to call it has been uh, a big aspect of the last two and a half years. You know, Rolly's a uh, big on, you know, showing you what you fill up and, and what you have to do and where you have to move. And John got his little iPad on the ice and he would have you down on your knees and show you where, you know, there is net and where there's not. And Julie had the same thing. And I think he had ropes as well. So we did a little bit of that, not, not too, too much, but enough to, you can understand, you know, where and what you're giving up and, and how little you actually have to move. I was going to say, and, it. sorry, go ahead. Yes. Sorry. And, and how much your depth actually affects that. So on the bad angles, your depth, you know, you don't need too much to, to cover most of the net. Whereas when they're right in the slot, you know, you will have to move a little bit more. So maybe you want to take that extra six inches of ice or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I think that's been a big factor for me being able to, you know, calm myself down, keep myself on composed the whole time and, uh, you know, liter- uh, sorry, make myself, uh, more efficient. I was going to say the other, the other part of that, I, I've heard it, like you said, like uh, box control, different phrases. I've seen it with the posts out in front, like as far back as like 10 years ago with the same ki- kind of concept, the idea that, you know, we grow up thinking about this six by four behind us, but really in order to get through us to there, the space we have to worry about is a much smaller net in front of us. And, and that concept, I think Connor Hellebuck said someone showed him, showed him that when he was quite young, um, working where they actually brought out the kitty nets and put it out in front of them. And to be able to think of the smaller net in front of us instead of the big one behind us, it seems to be a switch that really, you know, even already in the NHL can benefit goaltenders who maybe never thought of it that way. Does that seem sure. fair? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it helps you or it helps me at least uh, not overplay situations and not overreach and overextend and make holes that I don't need to make. So I feel like it's helped me really... Uh, you know, compact my game and, and keep me composed and efficient in those situations where maybe you think you need to stretch out and make that big save, but really you're right there. And if you do stretch out, you're making it harder on yourself than you need to do. Okay. So this season, um, obviously it ended while you guys were on a roll. Didn't start the way you guys wanted it to as a team and probably as goaltenders either. Uh, and geez, Usually that goes hand in hand. And one thing I've learned over all the years, um, my favorite phrase is goaltending does not exist in a vacuum. It is a function of team play. Uh, the constant reminder I throw out. What, um, what, how do you look back at this season, as, as odd as that is to say, when it's technically still not over, what, what changed, if anything? Because you had a lot of success last year too. Um, walk me back through this year and, and where there was there anything that changed that allowed for that second half run um, individually? Um, I, I don't know if anything changed versus kind of, well, I feel like at the start I wanted to do more than I needed to. I felt like we were under a lot of pressure as a team and, you know, we didn't get very many wins in the first month. So there was a lot of external pressure on us something that I haven't really felt in a while. Um, you know, people are on you. We're not performing. We're not, we're not winning. We're, we're struggling. So you feel a lot of outside noise. But once I was able to kind of compartmentalize that, I think, and, uh, you know, just focus on myself and, you know, doing my job to the best of my abilities and just blocking all that extra noise out, um, I thought I was able to just kind of, focus on what matters and, and just worry about myself. And as I started to do that, um, you know, we started to win more games. The team started to play a little bit better and, uh, you know, we started to find a little bit more success. So um, as a goal, you know, I, I really hate to talk about the team in a negative way ever. So if it's anything, it's myself. Um, I'm my own hardest critic. So um, I, I would say at the start, you know, a lot of that, that a lot of the struggles would have been on on myself so um, once I was able to kind of just settle it all down and you know it was really my first time being in the NHL where things hadn't gone very good so I had to learn how to deal with uh, you know you know kind of a storm and once you learn how to kind of put things into perspective I think uh, that really helped me just play in the moment and play present and uh, help me free up myself and you know play without worry you see there's that golf thing again one shot at a time it's the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do do you absolutely when you talk about feeling pressured do you you find yourself trying like 
if there's one thing about goalies, we, we can't, like, we don't get to dictate what happens. We don't get to dictate the play. And if you try and force things, like, it's almost like trying harder is not, not usually, it doesn't usually end well for, for uh, goaltenders. Do you, exactly. you find yourself doing that? Uh, yeah. At the start when we were struggling very, very much and we couldn't win a game, or I think it was the first eight games we, we were 0-8 or whatever it was. But uh, I feel like as you get in that rhythm of still struggling to find that first win, struggling to win, um, you know, you feel the outside noise and you're like, hey, I want to be the guy to make a difference. I want to make a difference in this game. But as a goaltender, by trying to make a difference, you hurt yourself. So I feel like if you just play to your best ability and win your game, then chances are you give yourself and your teammates the best chance to have success. So uh, once I kind of could settle myself down and just put things into perspective and focus on what I need to do, I think that kind of flipped the switch for the season there for me and uh, helped me worry about just playing my game to the best of my abilities and, uh, you know, worrying about what matters and, and blocking out all the extra noise that uh, doesn't matter. Not usually an easy thing to learn. Like I, that's not an easy lesson, especially in the midst of a season when you talk about in those terms about being present and things like that, have you worked with anyone in terms of, uh, you know, mental, um, tricks or not tricks, but you know, like tools, how to handle things like that, sports psychologists or anyone to sort of give you tools to help manage those situations? Um, honestly, I haven't really, I mean, we have a team, uh, a woman who works with our team who, is that role and she's we've talked a little bit and uh you know she's pretty good but for me i th i think going through it myself was the best thing ever that could have happened to me because when you're on the ice you can't bring anyone out there with you you're only there with yourself so i think going through that and struggling with myself kind of learning on the fly teaching yourself as you're in the moment i don't know if that works for everyone but I, I kind of like that for myself. I think uh, being able to do things on your own is the most important thing because when you're in a situation that's, uh, you know, uh, a un very unfriendly and un un uh, forgiving situation, the only person that can help you is you. So once you learn how to kind of, you know, take what you need and, and block out what you don't, um, it's a big, big, big help. I think, uh, some people do a little bit of meditation. I've tried a little bit of meditation, you know. Um, but for me, it's the philosophy of it. It's not necessarily doing it every single day, but like teaching myself the philosophy of how to let things pass and not try and block them out, but just let them come and let them go. So, um, you know, when I play, I like to think I'm pretty calm and I like to think that uh, things don't bother me too much, regardless of how good or bad they are. But you know, we're all human and we all have those days where things do. But uh, for the most part, I think I've improved a lot this year, especially at the start and to the middle of, of how to, you know, cope with situations that, that aren't in your favor and, you know, make the best of a worst case situation. Do you think like the lessons, I mean, I'm guessing all these lessons are going to help you no matter what, but if anything, when we get back going with hockey, do you feel more prepared to go back based on some of the things you went through this season? I think everything you learn your whole career helps you with each new game and each new season. So once you do something, you don't forget about it. You always have that tool with you. So um, I think that's why I think every year you can see goalies progress and goalies improve because if they struggle one year, they've learned how to deal with struggle. And then the next year when they get in that situation, they can pass through that situation a lot quicker because they have the tools to handle it. So, um, I think if you never have adversity and you never struggle, uh, when you do have it, it's going to be a lot harder to deal with than if you have faced it in the past. So I'm thankful for all the uh, the struggles I've had in my career, and I'm thankful for all the the times that haven't gone my way because now I know, you know, what to what to expect when it happens, how to deal with it, and how to you know make the best of the the bad situation that's coming. So I was going to say, like, uh, in terms of having to get off to a quick start when we like how you deal with the start of a season, there are lessons there, but it doesn't sound like the, the, it was, the start of the season was the problem per se. It was more other factors that went into influencing and, and making things a lot harder. Yeah. Well, at, at any situation, you know, you can look at yourself and you can be better. Um, so I think, you know, this season had it, had this season 
replicated itself and started the same way next year, I'd be better equipped to go into that and handle it better. So I think um, it's all, uh, uh, you know, learning lessons and, and growing tools that you've had from, you know, those experiences that haven't necessarily gone your way. Okay. So have you learned anything about how you're going to wear your bucket? <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely going to try and uh, put a better chin sling and uh, a little more foam in there because I didn't have it uh, suited up too, too well. <laughs> so just a little, is that what it was? Just a little loose in the bottom, bottom edge caught you or? I I uh, I have a thin piece of uh, foam in the chin cup that's literally just against the inside of the mask, so it's just foam against there, and the pressure pushed my teeth back and up. So I need a I need something with a little bit more space to cushion the impact. So that next time that happens, hopefully uh, it'll be better suited to to handle that and and not rip my teeth out. <laughs> Old school, old school, old school hockey with the, with the no front teeth look. So it's nobody will know you're a goaltender, right? What? Well, I mean, I'm not too happy about it, but uh, <laughs> if you look in the past, actually, I'm pretty sure Ben Bishop and Carey Price might've had that same thing happen to them. Maybe not to the same extreme, but uh, you know, w- with wearing the very, very loose, low, uh, low foam, chin sling so i think they all had to make an adjustment there with that yeah as well. Corey crawford too i remember he'd, he'd get him in practice once or twice a year and had to take trips to the dentist to get the <laughs> the the replacement teeth fixed so yeah, yeah you're definitely not alone on that one now i understand as much as you did, obviously you didn't want it you know being a number one goaltender and playing as much as you did once you guys got rolling is an adjustment at the nhl level you were forced to take a little time off after you took the clapper off, off the head and lost some teeth. Um, was there that reset, that period, was there anything there that allowed you to, you know, sort of take a step back and look at different elements? Like, can you look back and find a silver lining in that as well? And a lesson? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I started this year off not necessarily knowing what my role was going to be, um, knowing it was going to be me and Corey playing possibly 50 50 at the start and uh you know um kind of an uncertainty there but uh no i i really am thankful i played as much as i did at the start and, and towards the middle because it kind of taught me how to you know handle playing that much because that's the first time in my career i've ever played that that many games i mean i played three or four back-to-backs this year i played uh i think 12 games in a month so i played a lot of hockey early on in the season and when that when that happened, you know that was the game before the bye week, I believe. So I had a week off after that, and I think just being able to reflect on you know playing that much and learning how to just get right back into it day after day after day, and just uh, you know that adjustment. I think it was uh, a good learning curve for me because you know when you're in the minors and you're in the American League, it's a weekend league kind of deal, so you don't play too much throughout the week. So you have long practice weeks you play one or two games on a Thursday, Friday, Sunday, or something like that. But in the NHL, it's go, go, go. You have games every second day, basically the whole year. So you have a lot less time to, uh, you know, have those long practice weeks, which is good and it can hurt you at the same time. So um, from a development perspective, you know, you get less time to, to work and practice between games, but at the same time, you're getting that game experience that, uh, is always there. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword and learning how to balance that's really important. So, um, you know, at the start, I, I was kind of, you know, trial by fire there. I was in the, in the games, game after game, not practicing as much as I would have liked to, because, you know, you're trying to save your energy for games. But, uh, uh, I think as the season went on, um, they kind of made an adjustment to our workload and, uh, I got to work a lot more with Rolly after Christmas. And uh, I think that was good for me, especially in my first year or two years. Like it's kind of a a time when you're coming into the league and you're not a finished product. I'm not a finished product yet. So I still appreciate having those uh, long work days with the goalie coach and, you know, really helping you keep your game up and improve. Well, it's funny because that's a conversation I remember having with Corey way back in the day here in Vancouver about how you had to learn to manage your game and also manage your rest when you were playing more. You didn't have that time to to grind it out with Roly as often as he used to. And if you weren't careful, some of those details could slip and you had to find that balance. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to drop your practices off too much and, 
and lose the details that you have. And then you don't want to overwork yourself. So that come February, you're burnt out. So I think it's just uh, finding that happy medium of, you know, working hard and getting that extra time in practice and also limiting that to the level of, or the amount of games you're playing to kind of keep yourself right in that uh, perfect level of energy. So um, I think the more I've done it and the amount I've done it this year, I've kind of learned what works best for me and, and where I, I feel the most comfortable playing at with my practices. So um, I think that was something that was good to experiment with this year. Dude, you've learned a lot of lessons and you're like second year in the league. Like these are a lot of veteran answers I'm getting from you. Answers I'm used <laughs> to getting from guys who have been in the league for six, seven, eight years. So that, that probably bodes well, no, that you've learned all these lessons. And it leads me to another question. At a time when so many people want to default to goalies take time, goalies need time, and certainly some do. Everybody has a different path and curve. But there's that blanket of, you know, oh, goalies, we need to, you know, they're unpredictable. We, we got to wait on them. We don't know how long they're going to take. We are seeing more guys have success immediately. I mean, you were, you know, in the league at 21, 22. Um, you, Carter Hart's a guy that you've gotten to know over the years, having success early. Matt Murray. Like, there's guys around the league. Any thoughts on why? Like, as the league evolves and becomes more offensive, is that the game that you guys just grew up with? Is this less of an adjustment maybe to the style than maybe for a guy who's been playing a different way? Yeah, I think, I think you know, uh, a lot of it has to do with, um, even if I look two years ago in the, in when I was playing in Binghamton, um, it was wide open there. We had a really, really young team, and, you know, we gave up a lot of chances, and I was shelled pretty often. But I think it helped me, um, you know, this is kind of the game I played. And when I played in junior in Barrie, we had a very offensive team and we gave up a lot of chances as well. So it's kind of what I'm used to, you know, wide open kind of run again. I actually thought when, when I got to the NHL level that this is like very, very good defense. I was like, they're playing really, really good in front of me. And they would be like, Oh, we were bad tonight. And I'd be like, really? I thought you guys were pretty good. But um, I think that that was something that uh, definitely helps you. And uh, I don't know if it's that era thing because I hadn't been around before that, so I don't I don't have anything to compare it to. But I feel like this whole like um, the the offensive systems and and the way they're pushing offense and shooting for goals and all that, um, you know, moving forward trying to create more offense. I think that that's definitely been something that we've grown up with, um, or at least I feel like I've grown up with. So well, you're not I, you're not alone because I've gotten this. I mean, I've, whether it's Thatcher Demko or some of those other guys like Carter. This yeah. is a conversation we've had, and they, you know, this is the game they grew up with. The guy who played in the league for the last six, seven years, this dynamic offense, the East West, the, the deceptive releases, a lot of this is new to them. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I have nothing to con contrast it to, but uh, definitely um, the way it is now, I feel like this is the way it's kind of been for me, at least since I was playing in, in junior and Barry. So, um, even in Thunder Bay, when I played minor hockey here, it was still pretty. Um, you know, they, I think it might have been to do with the fact that our team in, in minor hockey wasn't the strongest, but uh, when we would go down to Toronto to play in those AAA tournaments, they would <laughs> kind of have their way with us a little bit. And, you know, I'd be under a lot of, uh, a lot of rubber there, but uh, I think it's kind of just been the kind of the way that hockey's kind of gone for me. So I feel like, you know, all this offense and all this, uh, you know, um, dynamic passing and shooting. It's just kind of been something that's been kind of every step of the way. So, um, no, I definitely feel like if you grow up with it, it's definitely less of an adjustment than having that switch kind of halfway through your career. So, no, I think I'm definitely fortunate along with the other goalies that are similar age to me who've kind of grown up with the same thing as well. So I think that that might be some of the reason why that see, it, it helps see, you. You know, after you just now you got to ask, you got to ask the old man Carter Hutton when you're on the ice next. Well, I mean, uh, he's mentioned that to me a couple of times. He said the game's changed so much since he's played, since he started playing. But uh, I feel like he's done a good job of always adapting because, you know, every st every level he's gone to, you know, he's had a, a different road than, than most. So, um, you know, he does a good job of trying to stay with all the, the new uh, trends and, and techniques and, and uh, positions whilst kind of maintaining what he already is and, without changing himself too, too much. But, uh, no, he's a pretty cool guy, and, and he's been great, uh, great friend to have at home and another a great local goalie. So 
she's been cool to hang out with here in the last couple of years. What are those conversations like with you and Zuli and him when the shooters are tired, it's the end of a session, you just take a knee at the middle and talk about goaltending? It's kind of cool because, you know, Carter and uh, Zuli, they're both like very, um, you know, creative people when they, when it comes to goaltending. And, you know, they both have a love for the position. So when we get to talk shop kind of at the end there, um, there's a lot of like different things that come up and right off the top of my head, I can't think of anything in, in, in particular, but uh, I know every session we have, there's always something that comes up where Carter's asking Zuli his thoughts on this, or he's asking me and I'm asking him. And it's just a big kind of collaboration of, you know, what should we do here? Or what do you like to do here in this position? So I don't know. I think that's kind of the the fun part about goaltending is there's always something that, you know, maybe you can learn or maybe you can do better or, or something that someone sees that you don't or someone does that you don't. And that's what's kind of fun is you're never done. You're never a perfect piece. You're, you're always learning and growing. So I think that's part of the, the fun of the position as well. That is a perfect answer, and it would be the perfect way to wrap this up. Unfortunately, I do have one more because I always have one more, and they're going to mock <laughs> me for doing this. But the glove, you've explained it to me. Of course, you. I don't know how many times you must have been asked this, but just for our bigger audience, how yeah. Mackenzie Blackwood ended up playing half the season with the Jonas and Roth glove. <laughs> well, it's partially, well, I shouldn't say partially. It's entirely my fault. But uh, uh, what happened was in the last season before I was using Corey Schneider's old glove. And then I got a couple of those made that were mine. Now, Corey the Schneider's summer. glove, there's some uniqueness to Corey Schneider's glove. No. Has he talked about that online? Because I knew it was a little bit of a secret. Well, a okay. it's a little bit of a, he's got, he's got, there's something different there. We'll just leave it that there's something slightly different. It's not quite a 590. It's not quite a 580. It's, it's, yeah. it's the Corey Schneider special. You told me that last time, I think a couple of years ago. So yeah, it's, it's kind of, I would say if anything, it's the most like a 590, but it's, it's a little bit different for sure. And I don't, I can't even honestly uh, pinpoint exactly what it is but the shape of it's a little bit different it's a little bit between a 580 and a 590 but mostly a 590 which is kind of it's kind of a like uh, Frankenstein glove but it's pretty cool anyway so I was using that last year and then in the summertime I'd, I'd always seen the 580 and thought the 580 looks so great it's got a huge pocket it, I want to use it and I tried it and, and I didn't like it I used it in my first skate back in the summer so you know, uh, obviously that's going to be a rough skate. So I didn't like it. I couldn't catch anything. I said, this glove sucks. And I used Schneider's glove the rest of the summer. And then the last week of the season, his glove was way too wet for a skate. And all I had in my bag was that Enros glove. And then I started using that and I was like, holy, I, I like this. This is catching well. So then I kind of went back to Jersey and uh, I started using that glove and I had a Bobrovsky glove for practice. So I didn't beat that one up. So I was using two different gloves. And I ordered the 580, but I got double T because I figured double T would be great. Turns out when the double T came in, I hated it. It, it changes the, the way, yeah, it changes the way it closes, right? Yeah, it didn't keep the pocket as, as uh, you know, strong and peaky. It kind of started to collapse a little bit on me. And I was like, I hate this. I'll just keep using the blue one. And then it took a long time for me to be able to get one of those uh, single T Blackwoods in my color and design. So. Um, that's basically why I screwed it up and it was a last minute change, but I figured, Hey, I'd rather be comfortable than look good. So, <laughs> and without having the photos in front of me, did you end up going five, eight, you went five eighty with a single T that's what I use now. Yeah. That's what you use now. So basically yeah. your first year and a half in the league, you had a glove with somebody else's name stitched into it. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's a great story yeah. though, right? See, it makes for yeah. a good story. And that's yeah. why I had to get it out of you before we left. Um, rather than finish on a perfect answer right before then. So this is my fault. Maybe your fault on the glove. My fault we dragged this on. Um, but our listeners are going to love this, Mackenzie. So thank you oh, so much okay. for yeah, taking no the problem. time. Um, congratulations on the new place in Thunder Bay um, and on all the success, obviously, with the Devils. I'm, I'm kind of hoping we get to see you on the ice soon. But uh, in the meantime, just stay safe and healthy. And uh, like I said, we'll see you in a rink at some point down the road. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for having me. And to everyone listening, to stay safe and uh, you know, try to make the most of it. There is a guy who's just 
plain old comfortable in his own skin, Woody. Yeah, he was, I mean, he's just, you know, open, honest. I mean, we like that. We get that from a lot of the guys. Uh, and I think that's because they know they're talking to fellow goaltenders. But, you know, I, even at the beginning, right from the start, when I talk about the start of his season and I'm couching it with the fact that I thought they as a team struggled defensively, like he didn't want to go there. He didn't want to use that as an out. He put that on himself. Um, you know, talked about having lessons to learn. Like it's not a finished product. It's just everything. There's a lot of humbleness there mixed in with some confidence, but an understanding. And he said it several times, including he delivered to me the perfect answer to end an interview on. Perfect. About the state of the game and how everything is evolving. Like it was like, it could be one of those things that I've, if I go and transcribe that answer tonight, it could be like one of those like, dialogues on goaltending that like Ken Dryden talking yeah. about, you know, could end up tattooed on someone somewhere one day. It's a quote board. And I still had to go last question just to get the Enroth glove thing in and spoil what would have <laughs> been a perfect moment. He delivered elegance and I hammered down on it with my stupid last question. But um, just, he he's, I mean, just giving of his time as well. We we're close to an hour and, um, that was with only one last question. Just there's a lot to like there. And I'm not surprised because I've been told by his peers that there's a lot to like there, whether it's Colin Zulianello, uh, Carter Hutton from their work in the summers, uh, Corey Schneider, obviously with the Devils, the guys he, he's competing with for starts, and Eddie Lack. Like Eddie Lack told me two years ago, like this guy, you know, there's going to be a process in terms of learning some of these lessons that Mackenzie talked about. Man, he's learned them at a young age. How many did he talk about it? Like, honestly, these are answers and conversations I get with guys when they're 26, 27, 28, not 23. And he he's learned a lot of them already. Eddie was like, the tools are there. It's just a matter of experience. This kid's going to be legit. And he's showing everyone that, that that's true uh, a lot sooner than, than maybe anyone expected. Where is he in the pecking order of Thunder Bay goalies, though? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know where he fits in the pecking order. That's not fair to choose, but <laughs> three in the National Hockey League right now. We know Alex Ald as well from Thunder Bay. Um, you know me, I like to play with numbers. Thunder Bay has a population just over 100,000. If, uh, if Toronto had as many goalies on a per capita basis, they could fill every slot in the National Hockey League and then some. So uh, there's something something in the water, and there's something great that uh, Colin and the other coaches up in Thunder Bay are doing, Woody. Yeah, no question. I mean, three goalies in the National Hockey League from Thunder Bay at the same time right now. Mackenzie Blackwood, Matt Murray, and Carter Hutton. All of them. Uh, Matt evidently doesn't get back there as often as he used to uh, in terms of the summer skates, but there was a time when all of them would go out and skate together with Colin Zulianello for, for stretches. Uh, that's a hell of an yeah. accomplishment. There are only three goalies from British Columbia in the National Hockey League in our entire province uh, with uh, Tristan Jari, Carey Price, and Martin Jones. So to have three from Thunder Bay in such a small area, and like you mentioned, Alex Ald and some of the some of the roots behind that, something that Matt Murray talked about in his first cup run, uh, not just looking up to Alex, but I think there was a there was a point early in his minor hockey days where Matt Murray actually got some equipment that Alex had donated through the Minor Hockey Association there, and that helped him either helped him keep playing goal or sparked him to play goal. I can't remember the conversation, but I remember hearing that story during Matt's first run to a Stanley Cup with the Penguins about the role Alex played. So um, we make jokes about a Thunder Bay goaltending mafia, but that that is a hell of an accomplishment for a pretty small area to have that many guys in the show. I think uh, Lorraine Brassois is going to have words with you this summer, Woody. Oh, do we, do we leave? Oh, I missed one. Oh, is LB, LB is, I mean, he lives in our backyard here he lives in from your... Surrey, Vancouver. LB, I apologize. I'm not good at, evidently me and searches don't match well. So <laughs> almost as many from Thunder Bay as there are from BC. That'll be weighing on your mind all off season with LB. Yeah, thanks, Hutch. Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for telling me that. Happened. Couldn't help it. Sorry. Uh, it is, it is really, really cool though. Even, I mean, I, I just think Hutch came up with the idea of comparables simply to take a shot at Toronto. That's that's my impression. Born and raised, born and raised, and still dry giving it to them. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, well done, and uh, one more plug for the uh, in goal in person webinar. 
with Braden Holtby and sports psychologist, the Edmonton-based sports psychologist, John Stevenson, coming up this Saturday uh, at noon Pacific time, 3 o'clock Eastern, and we're looking forward to it. You can send your questions in. Register at InGoal Mag, uh, Woody. Yeah, uh, and don't forget to head to our social media, Instagram, and get your entrance in for the CCM Axis All Out contest to win a custom set of CCM Axis pads and gloves. So register for the webinar, ingoldmag.com. Head to social media. Actually, you can do it on Twitter too, Instagram or Twitter. Make sure you tag us, tag CCM Goalie. Uh, enter the hashtag, enter your design off the CCM Customizer, and by the end of the month, you could uh, find out from our celebrity judges that you've won a set. Look forward to it. And it's going to be awesome with the uh, the contest. Uh, I look forward to your uh, submissions. You can't win, but uh, I look forward to seeing what the two of you uh, come up with. Yes, the two of you uh, come up with. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll all do it. It'll be, maybe we'll have the celebrity judges pick the best from our three because- uh, Can I, I use my cray- cool. Can I use my crayons on the customizer? <laughs> Well, here's the thing. This is this is interesting. I've had a number of people. And we, maybe we need to. I'm gonna have to reach out to the celebrity judges too here because we've had a number of people ask what their preferences are. I have seen sets come in that are are a hundred percent Anaheim Ducks old school. Ooh, yeah, Shiger mm-hmm. colors. Definitely trying to butter up a judge on that one. And then yet Roberto was a primarily a white guy, right? Yeah. Like I can turn my computer here if not the people anybody else can see, but. You know, we've got a set of his old Reeboks here in the office sign. Hutch has a set on his end too. Uh, not a set, but we've each got one. Um, kind of like doing a Vaughn review. You only get one pad. Um, so uh, he's a primarily white guy with a little bit of color on the chest. It'll be interesting to see. what We got to talk to Charlene and see what her preferences are. I designed our CCM Axis pads thinking, okay, I'm going to go, I'm finally going to go to the dark side. I'm going to go, you know, bold colors and I'm going to do a solid color pad crew. I think they call them our friend at the goal net. And now I see some of these designs with a white base with the way you're able to use the mm-hmm. prints to ac- accent the trim rather than just solid colored. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I may be going back to the white side because I love the way the axis looks with a little bit of trim. So don't read too much into that. I'm not a celebrity judge. Those of you who are out on your customizer right now as you listen to this, um, just come up with the best you can and our judges will... Our judges will figure out whether that's I'm good curious now. to see what you guys come up with. Uh, I'll go with the VGK uh, theme, but uh, look forward to it. And, and then with the celebrity judges, uh, it'll, it'll be neat to, to see what they have to say. We have got a set for you, Darren, from one of our regular uh, po- our webinar get. Like he's always on the webinars, guest attendees, yep. I guess, who's always submitting really good questions. Uh, Chris Matella, and I probably screwed up his last name, I saw his set on the internet last night, and it is a mix of Vegas and Bobrovsky, yeah. and it is sharp. It is <laughs> that was sharp. such a dad thing to say that you just spit out. I saw that on the internet last night. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm beca- I'm becoming Hutch. <laughs> uh, thanks to um, Mackenzie Blackwood uh, for joining us. Look forward to the Ingle in person with John Stevenson and Braden Holtby, Stanley Cup champion, coming up on Saturday, uh, this Saturday at noon Pacific time, 3 o'clock Eastern. And Lorraine Brassois, you are still firmly in our hearts, no matter what Woody says. Uh, I'm Darren Millard. On behalf of David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley, thanks for listening to Ingle Radio, the podcast. Mm-hmm.